What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and some past guests. Um, the most important past guest, Jimmy, is Haley Zwaite Zolo of StartingLine.VC, right? Um, check out that episode. Um, it's amazing. She talks about her, her uh, just a, a great experience in different startups, Trunk Club, and we talk a lot about geeking out on metrics, actually, which all businesses should be paying attention to. And other, you know, kind of the theme, Jimmy, is I'm thinking of what Chicago businesses I've had on the podcast. I had Ross Gordon, who started uh, Catchco and Mystery Tackle Box. Uh, Jeremy Smith started Spot Hero. Dan Zawacki started Lobster Graham. Ethan Austin I had on started Give Forward. Um, and now he's with gig wage. So check those episodes out on inspired insider. Um, before I introduce today's guest, uh, this episode is brought to you by rise 25, which I co-founded my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help businesses give to their best relationships, their dream 100 relationships by helping you run your podcast. So, you know, Jimmy, for me, the most important thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, people I admire, people I want to help shout from the rooftops what they're doing, what their company is doing. And I've seen no better way since the over the past 10 years uh, than having them on my podcast and profiling them and their company. So if you are a business out there and you've thought of, hmm, maybe I've thought about starting a podcast. We've done it. I've been doing it for over a decade and helping them, helping businesses do it. So go to rise25.com and learn more and contact us. Um, and so Without further ado, I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Jimmy Zolo. He's the co-founder and CEO of Collaborata, and it's a Chicago-based company serving the insights and marketing research space. They help companies find, shape, and buy expert-led multi-client research projects. And he's going to give some interesting examples. And I'm not sure. I was watching several videos, Jimmy, and um, the way I think of it is you help companies get expert market research um, and help that company grow and innovate at um, kind of a crowdfunding price because there's multiple companies using research. Um, and so it's, it's really an amazing uh, service and business. They've been featured in Business Insider, built in Chicago and, and uh, many, many more. And he's also the co-founder of Joe and Bella, which is a service that provides older adults with a full array of products they need. It's, a, you know, it's amazing for residents of care communities, their families, caregivers, and you, you know, it's at joeandbella.com. And previously, Jimmy actually helped drive growth at Grubhub, uh, which was, if you don't haven't heard of it, Chicago, one of Chicago's most successful tech startups ever. And he helped develop Grubhub's industry-leading restaurant network. And I think you were traveling all over the country, helping launch new markets and grow existing ones and also worked for the Chicago Bulls. Jimmy, thanks for joining me. Th th thanks for having me. That's a uh, that's a big intro. So I I, I appreciate it. The pressure's on. It's I, all I, fact checked. I, I I don't think I'll live up to Haley's podcast, but I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to, to to come in right underneath. That's that. a smart husband to say that. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, I want to talk about collaborata for a second and maybe just in your words what you guys do and and i want to before we hit record we were talking about social equity but um did i get that right as far as what do you guys do like who are the perfect ideal clients to be using collaborata yeah i i, I think you explained it really well so we we bring together multiple organizations to share the cost of really large scale ambitious research projects that are typically too large for one individual organization to undertake on their own. Um, and the type of clients we work with are, are the major brands. So it's the NBA, it's Reebok, it's Disney, it's AARP. It, it, it are, it's these massive brands, but even despite their size, um, sharing may, makes sense because you can stretch your dollar and you can do things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, so right now, what we're working on, we, we put together a group called the Multicultural Insights Collective, which is um, a collaborative about, of about seven other research organizations, um, all of whom besides me are led by either a woman or a person of color. And our first project that we're launching um, uh, early 
this year, hopefully by end of February, is called Words Matter. The goal is to take a, a serious look at the language that we use around race, around social justice, around social equity in this country, and, and, and put together a roadmap for brands on, on how to best authentically engage in that conversation. Um, this came about in the aftermath of George Floyd. Um, we, we were watching as brands like really rushed to respond and put out statements. A lot of them immediately within 24 hours put something up on social media saying, hey, we stand with Black Lives Matter and here is why. But our question was, are the statements that those brands were making authentic? Is the statements they're making um, consistent with what their actions as an organization are? And are they even what uh, people of underrepresented groups and people of color actually want brands to be saying and doing in those times? So, so, so it's, it's a really ambitious undertaking, but, but, but something that, that, that matters a lot. Have you found anything so far from the research? Or is, like, are there any examples? Or maybe you can comment on, because um, you're seeing this come out and now you're probably digging into the research on there's two different things. One, the message you put out and two, is it resonating with the people it should be resonating with? Right. So what have you been seeing as you're digging through the research as it is a big undertaking, what brands or, you know, should be saying or doing that is shown in the research? Yeah. So I, I think we've learned two really interesting things so far. The, the first one, which is not surprising is that authenticity is really easy for, for people to figure out. So an example of a good and a bad. Um, NASCAR this year, as far as a good, it went, went, when um, they removed the Confederate flags from being allowed in their uh, arenas. And when Bubba Does that Wallace, seem like a no-brainer or no? It, it, I mean, it, 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 it should have been a no-brainer, but for their fan base, it, 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 it was uh, really controversial at the time. Totally. They got, they, they, they got thousands and thousands of fans saying they're never coming to a NASCAR event ever again. But, but, but uh, they, they finally put, put their foot down. And then at the same time, Bubba Wallace, their, their only uh, driver of color, found a noose in his locker. Um, and wow. they, they stood with the, the, the NASCAR really strongly stood behind him and all the drivers stood behind him and, and had maybe the most iconic sports moment uh, of 2020 because of it. And the interesting thing, looking back at 2020, NASCAR's numbers relative to every other sports league were, 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 were phenomenal. They saw the, the least drop out of every other sport league during, during lockdown and during quarantine. And I think a lot of that goes to, um, they weren't hiding behind their values. They were, they were authentic about it. On the flip side, I, I won't- Real I won't, quick, yeah, you know, Jimmy, before we get to the flip side, you bring up something very interesting with, with NASCAR and it, it kind of um, parallels what happened, you know, whenever someone's watching this, you know, at, at Capitol Hill and- um, I was watching one of the, the Michigan constituents talk about how, you know, if talking about that certain things are wrong with the people that stormed, even if it's going to affect you getting elected, right? And it seemed like that's what you're saying with, with NASCAR as well. It was, it's maybe a no brainer decision for some people, but it, they knew it was going to piss a lot of people off. It, that, that, that's exactly right. To, to take a stand that is going to offend a portion of your base, even if you think it's the morally right thing to do, hasn't always been easy for big brands to do, especially recently, they, they tend to hide behind things. So the, the flip side was that was, I, I, I won't throw this specific company under the bus, but there, there was a fast food organization who, who like everyone else put out a statement about how they stand with Black Lives Matter and they believed in defunding the police and all that. Um, a, a couple hours after they released that statement, they fired an employee for wearing a Black Lives Matter face mask to work. So like that inauthenticity, when that gets caught, um, really, really hurts. And it, and it becomes so obvious who's uh, speaking out of both sides. Um, do any other good examples stick out along with NASCAR? Yeah, you know, I, I actually think um, the, the NBA, who their numbers were way down, but that's a longer conversation as to why. I think it's more that their target demo is on social media, not sitting behind watching a full NBA game anymore. But I think the NBA did a phenomenal job this year. 
um, not just in how they stood up um, for Black Lives Matter, but but there have been um, they stood up for voting rights acts. They 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 did everything they could to make every single NBA stadium. Um, available for in-person voting during the election, which was a pretty incredible undertaking, something that had never been done before and was done because of not just the actions of the players and their sort of um, push, but, but, but the entire league got behind it. So they, the, the NBA has just been uh, an absolute leader in saying what you mean and meaning what you say. Jimmy, talk to me about that for a second. So the NBA comes to you, they're like, Jimmy, we totally see this is valuable. We know words matter. We need to be better at this. And usually the, the companies that are really good at it want to be better. And right. how does it work with, you know, they're like, let's do it. How does it work with them working with you? Yeah. So there are a few different ways to work with us. The, the first is typically Collaborata is essentially, essentially an incubator of big ideas. So, so for example, in this case, the idea is putting together a universal language de uh, definitions of, of what these, uh, the words of social justice and social equ equity actually mean. So, so when we have that idea, we, we then form a team behind it. Um, we always bring in a subject matter expert, um, if, if not multiple subject, subject matter experts, as well as bring in some, some unique research tools to make sure that we can do the project at scale in a really interesting, effective way. Um, from there, once we sort of define the goals of the research, we, 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 we look to go find others and, and, and see who maybe natural allies are, who would be good to share that research with. Um, but in other cases, there, there have been some really surprising collaborations that we're proud of. We, we've had Procter & Gamble and Unilever on the same project together, which was pretty cool. We had Bank of America and Global Atlantic Financial and Wells Fargo together um, and a number of other financial institutions who typically feel like competitors, but for the sake of learning and knowledge and, and, and sort of expediting their own internal growth and innovation, they're willing to work with competitors, which, which is really validating for what, what we're trying to do. When they collaborate, what is, how do they typically use the research? So if you know, in the, if the MBA is like, cool, like we actually, um, with social, um, equity, here's some language and here's some stuff that we want to use. Do they usually actually push it out across commercials or logo? Like, how have you seen the, them use the, the research? Yeah. So it, it, it depends on the specific team that we're working with within an organization. Typically though, um, it's, it's used for, for communication strategies. So across media, so whether that's commercial, whether that's social media, how they're using their brand messaging. Um, a lot of times it's also product innovation too. So we, we've done a lot of really interesting work in the aging and longevity space, uh, specifically with, with companies like Procter & Gamble and Bank of America. And those organizations use that information to ensure that they're best serving a specific audience and developing the types of products and services that can help them specifically in this case at, as they age. Um, the, the other interesting one is occasionally, depending on the organization that we're working with, they've actually used this for lobbying purposes as well, hmm. um, to ensure that they have a full and complete understanding of, uh, of a specific, uh, group of people within this country and how to make sure that this country is best representing their needs. Let's talk about, before we hit record, you were talking about hacking longevity. That talk, that's right up my alley. I, I love talking about health stuff. Um, so, and I didn't want you to tell me anything because I want to hear it for the first time. <laughs> so what did you mean by that? So Hacking Longevity is a series of research projects that we've been doing over the past four years. We're actually now on our, our uh, third one. So we, we started with, with the foundational research called Hacking Longevity, which took a look at uh, Americans uh, 65 plus in this country and, and sort of looked at their aging journey. Because as we know right now, um, the way in which we age is very different than how our, our parents' generation aged. And uh, the way millennials are aging, the way Gen Z is aging is going to be very different for, 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 for a multiple multitude of reasons, whether that be our, our health, our, our financial stability, um, the, the, the activities that we do. Um, so we took a foundational look at aging within this country. From there, we then uh, what we found was that 
your specific place that, that as you age, there are specific events that can happen that fundamentally change who you are as a person, right? Not, not, not surprising, but we, we defined five of them for, for the next hacking longevity um, uh, and dove into those, what we call life shifts. One of them we called aging single. So it was an individual who either became divorced or widowed later in life, obviously totally unexpected and could have major, obviously financial ramifications, but, but is also really impactful from a health perspective as well uh, and how that can impact someone. We looked at be, uh, a happier one, like becoming a grandparent for the first time and how that changes somebody's life. And, and particularly now, boomers are the most involved grandparents uh, we've ever seen. They, 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 they really are kind of second parents to, to their grandchildren. They're spending more money that than grandparents have ever spent on their grandchildren, which is a, a, a really interesting thing. And for organizations that we work with, that's something that they definitely need to better understand. So what have you found with the research from Hacking Longevity that you've changed? because you know it's going to help you live healthier, longer, better, happier, whatever it is? Yeah, I, I, I think there are a few things. Um, the, the first one from a health perspective is I, I think it reinforces the need to be really, really active and really healthy with, 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 with how, how I eat and and. and for, for me being healthy, that means low impact. So I try and ride my bike as much as I can Although in Chicago right now. That's, that's not very easy. Um, but, but from a diet perspective too, that, that means a lot. The, the, the other big thing from a financial perspective is, is understanding that um, despite hopefully the, the plenty of success that Collaborate and any other endeavor that we may have is that, that millennials are not going to retire in the same way that our parents' generation will retire. Um, the retirement age right now in six is, is 65. The reason that retirement age was originally set at 65 is at the time the average American was dying at the age of 64. So, so we need to know that, um, that sort of social security nest egg probably won't exist for our, our generation. And we're going to have to work later in life than our parents' generation ever did. And just sort of be prepared for that and understand, Hey, we, we've got to save now, but also, not burn out now. We, there, there, there's that balance knowing that we're going to be working later into life, regardless of, of, of a lot of um, things that are outside of our control. What made you start going into the hacking longevity? And one of my favorite books is the blue zones. And, and it's kind of, it talks about kind of some of the lessons for living longer. And it did some, you know, mathematical research on, in, you know, there's certain blue zones in the, in the world of people are more likely to live to over a hundred. And so I'm fascinated by this, this type of research. Why, what made you go down that path? No, it was actually the inspiration of one of our clients. Uh, so one of our clients is AARP and they've, they've been our champion behind this project for, for the last four years and have been really sort of instrumental in driving uh, where we go. This was something that they wanted to get behind. And, and we've partnered with uh, an expert as well on this. Her name is Lori Bitter. She's the president of an organization called the Business of Aging. And, and she's a, a phenomenal when it comes to understanding this audience. She used to lead JWT's Boomer Group. She, she, she's a sort of a foremost thought leader when it comes to aging and longevity in this country. But, but that, that was really the inspiration with, was AARP as well as some past research we had done uh, on generations in the country. And this, this kind of, you know, talk, you know, goes a little bit, Jimmy, into Joe and Bella. You're right. And, and you started Joe and Bella and that, it, that comes from a personal story. Yes. So thanks for bringing that up. So, so just within the last few weeks, we, we've officially launched Joe and Bella. So joeandbella.com. Um, and it comes from a very personal place. So, so back in 2012, um, it was no longer safe for my, my grandparents to live on their own. Uh, despite having 24 seven in-home care, my, my grandmother was still falling and it was, it was just dangerous for them not, not to be in an assisted care community. My grandfather at the time was suffering from Parkinson's and dementia, and it made sense that they had a higher level of care uh, afforded to them. So 
we, uh, after my grandmother fell again, uh, we, we, we rushed to move them into a care community uh, outside of Chicago. And it was, it was Christmas Eve. So it was a totally last minute move in. It was a horrible night. And as you're moving uh, a loved one into a care community of any kind, whether it's independent living or skilled nursing or memory care, it's really daunting. And you, you question a lot. You, you think, am I doing the right thing? thing? Is this really what's best for them? And if, if you say yes to that, you still don't know, do they have everything they're going to need when they're there? Do they have uh, all of their things? Do they have all the clothes, do they have the right toiletry. Do they uh, have the right technology to, so that we can communicate with them better in this new, in this new environment, that's going to totally change how they've lived their lives up until this point. So it's this, this really horrible and daunting experience. And the, the first day that, that we were there, the, the Christmas Eve that we moved them in, is, is when we met Joe and Bella. They, um, they, they, we, we noticed they were kind of goofing around and, and following us around and making a lot of jokes. And we, we started talking to them. They were two widowed Holocaust survivors who ended up being um, uh, essentially adopted grandparents to us. They started coming to every single uh, family event we had, whether that was Thanksgiving or Hanukkah, you, you name it, they, they were there and they played a really instrumental role in my grandparents' life. They were sort of this really sort of phenomenal uh, transition that, that part, part of this transition that, that if they didn't, if they weren't there, would have been so much harder on my grandparents. They, they ate every single meal together for the, for the rest of my grandfather's life. So it was mm. this, this really, really beautiful thing. Um, so, so that was back in 2012. Uh, my grandmother had been in a care community ev ever since. And then during COVID, um, the challenge of helping her was obviously expedited because they had to go into full lockdown. We, we could no longer a benefit of going into a room and looking around and saying, hey, do you have enough toothpaste? Do you have enough mouthwash? Or how's your clothes? Do you need, do you need new shoes? Do you need new sh socks? Because she was also now at this point suffering from dementia. So even if we asked her those questions, she wasn't able to answer. And if we were asking the caregivers who were doing such a phenomenal job, they could look. But their time at that point was best served ensuring that COVID wasn't getting into the community. Um, so that, that's why we launched Joe and Bella. So it's a, a really simple service to ensure that those that are in assisted care of, of any kind have really easy access to, to everything they need from toiletries to some really cool tech products that are out there now to, uh, to clothing and kind of everything in between. Thank you for sharing that. That's, it's such a tough journey. Wow. I mean, especially aging. I mean, it's no joke, you know? Um, so how does it work? Someone goes to the site and what do they do? Yes. Yeah, so someone can go to the site, whether that is um, a, a caregiver at a community can order on behalf of their, at behalf of their residents or uh, a family member uh, ordering on, on behalf of their loved one. And you can sign up and get a lot of products, uh, anything that is consumable. So whether that's toiletries, you can set up for automatic reordering. So you never have to worry about your loved one. Uh, running out of anything that they would need. And then there's also a bunch of other really great products up there as well. And we even have really cool gifts up there. Because uh, I know one of the toughest things was always trying to figure out what to get my grandmother, because the, the, the default answer was always just a crossword puzzle, because that was the, the one thing that even with dementia, she could always do a crossword puzzle in pen. So we knew we could always get her that, but that, but, but we've been able to find some, some really great products up there. And we're we're, we're pretty excited. About I love it. it. Some people can check that out. Joe and Bella.com. Joe and Bella.com. Okay. Thank you. Um, back to, to collaborator for a second. What was the initial idea behind it? Yeah. So the, the initial idea, um, man, and, and it has changed a lot. We we've gone through like every startup, a, a million different pivots, but the, the initial idea was it was just gonna be a crowdfunding platform for research. Uh, of any kind. And at the time it was going to be each project needed 10 clients attached to it. And a project would go up there and uh, you would pay 10% and you get the results. Um, it's become way more hands-on than that. It, it didn't really become the open marketplace that we envisioned just because research 
is so proprietary that organizations weren't necessarily comfortable going on there and engaging in it with that type of way. And the other big thing that we had to go in and adjust was um, our research partners had to be of such a high level of vetting in order to get on the platform now that we didn't do initially. So for each project that we now run, um, we, we go out and get someone who is uniquely qualified to do that work based upon their, their level of experience and expertise versus initially any research firm that would come to us with a cool idea, we'd say, go, go and put it up. But it, it's, it's really shifted since then. Jimmy, what was a key, you know, oftentimes when companies change, it's probably, it's usually driven by customers demanding certain things and, and the smart ones listen to their customers and what yep. they're asking and deliver what they want and then more of that. But what was a, a customer or a request you got that really helped you shape what the company does now? Yeah, you know, I, I think it was, what was when we found out that the, the actual model that we had set up just didn't make any sense. So, so it was every project needed 10 clients. So everyone was paying 10%. That didn't make any sense. So, so I think it was actually ARP who came to us with the idea of hacking longevity and said, Hey, we're actually willing to underwrite a really high percentage, well over uh, 10% of this cost in order to get the research off the ground. And also that way it helps incentivize some other really great companies to come and collaborate with us. So the idea then really shifted from this isn't just about cost savings, but it is the value of the collaboration. It's the value of the partnerships. And it's about having this, what we call our champion behind it, ARP, who, who's really sort of instrumental in, in, in driving the project and the research for. I'm interested also, Jimmy, how you navigate these, what you looks like competitors, and they're getting this intel and this IP <laughs> and getting them to work together. So what are some of those, give me an example, and you talked about one earlier. At first glance, these look like competitors. And, and mm -hmm. I would think they, they are spending the time, energy, and money on this IP. They don't wanna share it with the other organization. You know, What was the collaboration conversation look like so it gets people out of that mindset of no, actually this is actually better than, you know, together than not. Yeah, it's, it's really tricky. And there's still people we will run into that will refuse to work with us just for that point. There, there was, um, I won't say the company, but there was a VP at one of the biggest research buyers in the country. So, so there, there are about six, six companies that really sort of dominate this landscape. And he said, um, Jimmy, I, I don't really understand what you're doing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, th this, was, this was about five years ago. I don't think I would ever buy anything from, from you because I don't want anyone else to be able to see what we do. But he goes, but I'd also never get in an Uber. So maybe you have a decent idea. <laughs> that, then from there, he's, at the end of the call, we, we, we spoke for another 30 minutes. He goes, and by the way, if, give me a call back if any of my big competitors buy something and let me know what it is because I'll, I'll sign on board then and collaborate with them. So he just didn't want to be the first one to jump in. And I think that's typically what it is, is that 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 FOMO, the, the fear of missing out on this information has, has been really key, key and critical to us. But, but also, at the end of the day, we live in a world where there is so much data. There is so much information that everyone's going to get it somehow or some way. Fa Facebook is getting the same information Google is. Granted, they're, they're collecting oh, slightly different data sources, but, but, but the depth of their data is, is similar. So, so everyone else who is not Facebook, who is not Google, who is not Amazon, is at this massive data disadvantage. And what we're trying to do is democratize access to all of this other data that's out there in the world and give them a level playing field against these, the, these tech giants. Um, be, because right now, it's, it's not, not fair to the level of access that they have relative to everybody else. Talk about some of the popular research categories. So we talk about, you know, obviously hacking longevity and health, right? Mm -hmm. Social equity and language. What else have you seen, um, I guess, trends of people researching? Yeah, we, we've done a lot of generational research um, recently, which has been pretty interesting. A lot of folks really want to understand Gen Z and how uh, uh, 
brands are finally starting to pick up on how different they are than millennials and how much they reject about millennial behavior, which is, which is really, really interesting. I think an example of that would be when millennials think about sustainability for them, that's, um, buying from a brand that, that, that says they're sustainable on their website versus Gen Z would go and buy uh, thrift clothes. So that, that, there are these really massive differences between these generations. So, so, so I think that's the first thing is we're, we're doing a lot of generational work. We, we do a project every year called Generation Nation that takes a foundational look at the four largest generational cohorts in the U.S. and, and sort of compares and contrasts their, their, their different views. And it's sort of a really interesting thing to see how the country is shifting over time because it's something we've done for so long. Um, last year, we did an interesting project uh, called Gen Z Moms which the idea is to take a forward look at the next, what the next generation of parents is going to be. And we worked uh, with some really cool brands on that one as well. Hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. Cause I could see you are seeing a lot of this first and then you, you really have a broad view of the trends that are going on. Um, I want to hear about it, what shaped you um, and you know, specifically Grubhub and the Bulls. Talk about what were some of the lessons you learned in the story from the Chicago Bulls days. Yeah, so working for the Bulls was was really cool. <laughs> so the 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 offices for the Bulls are are right there in the United Center, and I grew up a Bulls fan, so it was. It, it was just incredible. Every single day, you walk into the arena, past the Michael Jordan statue. And then go and get to work. So, so it was it was a phenomenal and cool experience. But I was there at a unique time. So I was there the uh, year of the NBA lockout, where it was a shortened season, as well as the previous season, uh, Derrick Rose had won the MVP. So there was all this hype around the Bulls, and um, I was there just for w- w- within a few months because of the hype around the team coming into the season. We had sold out literally everything there was to sell every single season ticket, every individual game ticket, just about every single sponsorship was gone. And we more or less had the option of, Hey, you guys can stay and be sort of glorified customer service at this point throughout this year. And then next year, start, start selling again um, or not. And, and I chose or not. So, so I, I, I left without really knowing what I wanted to do, but I knew um, as a salesperson um, and someone that liked to be really busy or really needs to be really busy, that I wanted to find a situation where um, I couldn't sell out, that there, there was always going to be something next to do. And, and sort of that, that feeling of, of we, we had achieved something, uh, like we've gotten to the top of the mountain and there was no sort of other, other place to go it was really weird. So, I, so because of that, that, that's how I fell in love with startups. And I had gone to, a little bit after that, I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had gone to 1871 just to sort of network with some people. And I had stumbled into um, a talk. Uh, Matt Maloney, the founder of Grubhub, was speaking there. And, uh, and, and I just sort of fell in love with what he was saying about how he was so convinced at the time. And this was well before online food ordering had really taken off, but he was so convinced that Grubhub was going to blow up and that they were going to be the next big Chicago startup. And uh, that night I went, I applied for a job at Grubhub. I think I interviewed a few days later and started the following week. And uh, it was just a phenomenal experience and, and really sort of built my love for startup culture, especially here in Chicago. You know, it seems so obvious now, but back then it wasn't so obvious on online ordering. What, when you went into a new city, like, cause you had to go for expansion. What were some of the conversations you had to have? Cause you have to do some convincing. It wasn't, I mean, these people were early adopters, I imagine. Yeah, it was, uh, those early conversations were so different than the conversations I would have four years later. The first, the first few years were people didn't believe it would work. Restaurant owners would, would, would laugh at us, said, no, no one's going to order online. No one's going to order food. They're just going to call us. Why wouldn't they just call us on their phone? This doesn't make any sense. We, we were getting laughed at. And, and the other big challenge was, was actually competing with another Chicago startup, Groupon, 
because we would talk, call, hey, this is Jimmy from Grubhub. And they said, no, we don't like Groupon. And they would hang up on us. <laughs> um, so, oh, so, geez, both from Chicago. Right. It was, yeah. it was way too similar. But um, eventually what ended up happening and what ended up working was literally just sitting down with restaurant owners and doing the math and saying, all right, here's how many orders are coming into this zip code that right now are going to these restaurants next door, these restaurants that you're competing with. And then sort of going through their own costs on a per order basis to show them, hey, this is what you could make on a per order basis if you were to start working with Grubhub. And and once we sort of got over that threshold um, um, and sort of learned how to best communicate that with our restaurant partners, things really started taking off. Any favorite customers that you worked with at Grubhub? Absolutely. So there, there was a Chinese restaurant um, in St. Louis and no one there spoke English. And they were, they were all uh, first generation Americans and they had just opened up a few months earlier and they were really, really struggling. And I was trying to convince them to be on Grubhub and, and explain that, hey, Chinese restaurants are doing really well in St. Louis. And, and maybe this is a good way to get, get, get your name out there. And um, they, they didn't know what I was saying. It was, we, there was this really tough language barrier. And then um, they had taken me into their kitchen because it was, it was before uh, dinner rush was about to start. And their, uh, I think, 13 or 14 year old daughter was in there doing their homework, doing her homework. And she had, been over, had overheard our conversation and she spoke fluent English and she started translating on my behalf to her parents as to why they ought to be on Grubhub. And uh, because of her, they ended up joining. They've ended up being a, a really big success. They've, had, they've op- opened multiple restaurants. Um, and it's just a sort of a really cool story of sort of the, the iconic American dream of, uh, of coming here, opening up your own business, really being an authentic family business. And it's, uh, it's been fun to watch. So what made you, Jimmy, what was the next transition? So towards the end of Grubhub, I mean, it's, it's grown a lot, right? Yes. It, they, they've been phenomenal. So my, uh, the transition out of Grubhub was um, right after Grubhub went public um, that following week, they brought in a team of attorneys to tell us, all oh, what, what the new rules of operations were, um, which is great. You're, you're now a publicly traded company. You ab- absolutely have to behave differently than, than how you had before. But for me, as sort of someone who had fell, fallen in love with Grubhub because it was a startup and, and sort of that freedom and the flexibility that startups entail, um, once they gave that speech, I, I started um, coming up with different business ideas <laughs> and figuring out what, what, what I wanted to do on my own. I, I, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. My, my dad was an entrepreneur. My, my grandfather was. So I knew I always wanted to do my own thing. And right after that IPO, it just felt like the right time. What, what's some best advice you've received from your dad or your grandfather? <laughs> I'll, 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 give, I'll give you one, one from my grandfather is not to always trust your gut, <laughs> which, which, uh, which was a, a, an interesting lesson. So his story, his entrepreneurial story was he was college roommates with Hugh Hefner. And uh, the two of them had started a, a magazine together called Chicago. And it did okay. I think it had a few editions before it eventually went under. And, and Hefner came back to my grandfather and said, hey, Bert, I've got this great idea for a new magazine. Uh, I'm going to call it Playboy. And he explained to, to my grandfather what it was. And my grandfather goes, absolutely not. I do not want to be a part of that. It's going to be a horrible failure. <laughs> you're, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. And uh, uh, Hefner, of course, goes on to found Playboy. In those first few editions, um, most of the articles are written uh, by my grandfather under a pseudonym because my grandmother refused to let him use his last name in it. So, so my, it, it was something they didn't like to talk about a lot, but, but the lesson is that your, your gut's not always right <laughs> to, 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 to take chances. That's amazing. That's an amazing yeah. story. <laughs> Do, does he still have those laminated somewhere or the, the articles he wrote in the, those so, first editions? <laughs> It's, it's a funny story. So they never had 
any of them because my grandmother refused to have them in the house. <laughs> she didn't want any association I with could, it. I yeah. can get, I get that. Yeah. But yeah. May, maybe like five or six years ago, I saw a first edition w- was on eBay. So I, I paid way too much money to get a first edition. I, I've got a frame now, which is pretty cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Your wife. Yeah. Your wife's like, uh, why are you buying this? You're like, it's, yeah, it's don't worry. research it's my grandfather's <laughs> legacy i need right. to buy these <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly you could explain that one away um first of all i have two last questions jimmy i just want to thank you thanks for sharing the amazing stories everyone should check out collaborata.com they can check out joanbella.com check out other episodes of the podcast i always ask um because it's inspired insider is there any other places we should point people towards by the way um online to check out what you're, what you're working on. Are those the best places? Those are the best places. Uh, Instagram shop, Twitter at collaborata at shop, Joe Bella. Um, but yeah, though, please, please check us out. And, um, so, somehow, and what I just said, that turned on Siri. <laughs> so Siri, Siri started playing from that. I'm, I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> I don't know if anyone could top a grandfather story that you just told, um, <laughs> Jimmy, but um, I always ask since Inspired Insider, what has been a challenging time, low moment? We know is the entrepreneur journey, it's lots of ups and downs. And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment for you uh, in the journey? What's, what's been a challenging time or a low point that you think back on that you know kind of pushed you forward? Yeah, uh, you know, get, getting Collaborate off the ground was really, really hard. Like, like I said, or initially, we, we just didn't have the, the model right. And it took us nearly 10 months before we made a sale. And those first few days after you wake up of quitting your job and not having a salary, at first it's exciting. And then you go 10 months without making a sale. And every type of doubt that you've ever had, every negative thought you've had about, am I the right person to do this? Is this a good idea? Why would I leave sort of a rocket ship of a company? Every single doubt creeps in. Um, so that was really, really hard. Um, and but, you're a salesperson, I mean, at heart, right? Yeah. I mean, you're used to going city to city and, and making sales. Exactly. So to, to go 10 months, that was, it was, it was, it was brutal. Um, but once we broke through and once we had our first big success or our first big success was a project called Generation Nation and it brought in 10 companies and some iconic brands, including the NBA and Ford and Reebok and among others. And once that happened, the trajectory of the business sort of changed overnight. And it changed because number one, we didn't stop testing new ideas our, our initial sort of assumptions of how we were going to build the business were, were all wrong. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of our assumptions about how we're going to continue to build the business are wrong, but we just didn't stop testing and we didn't stop trying to, to, to figure it out. Um, so that, 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 that why didn't you it. quit? I mean, at month four, month five, month six, month seven, month eight, what kept you going? You know, I, I, I don't have a good, good explanation other than I, really hate to quit. I was, I was so convinced that there was something there that we were, we were sitting on an idea that it fundamentally made sense for organizations to share their data, to, to democratize it so that they can compete with it, the big tech companies on an even playing field. I was so convinced of that just basic thesis. I knew we had sort of how we do that wrong, but I thought if we just kept sort of poking at it, that we had figured it out. And yeah. Yeah, you're like, th- your belief was kind of pushing you forward and maybe the execution, you know, you'd had to tweak. I gotcha. Um, on the flip side, a mm-hmm. uh, proud moment for you. Yeah, so I, I, I would say launching Joe and Bella has been a really proud moment. Um, so Collaborata for us is sort of like this really great commercial product that we've put together. Joe and Bella to me is something that's really personal um, that right now for folks in assisted care or nursing homes or skilled nursing, it is really, really hard. They can't see their families. A lot of them can't talk on the phone. It's, it's horrible. So for us to be able to um, give back in any way we can to help those in assisted care in any small way is something that we're really proud of. And we've been able to roll up the site and get it launched 
uh, in a couple of months has been while we're running another business full time has been, been something we're really, really proud about. Jimmy, thank you. Everyone check out collaborata.com. Check out joanbella.com and more episodes on the podcast. Thanks again. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.